So today we are going to go over some topics in physics 3.4. First of all, welcome uh, to 8R Notes, where we basically prepare students for VCE success. We provide a lot of free resources, resources such as study notes, lectures, discussions, videos. We also provide you with newsletters, an 8R calculator, articles, and heaps more. Now, in physics 3.4, we are going to talk about several concepts. Uh, today's goal is to do a lot of practice questions from VK exams that were hard and showed how to approach hard questions. Now, now, why aren't we doing content summaries? Well, at this point in the year, summarizing through practice questions is more effective for most students to make sure you have the knowledge and skills you need. Always write the formula you're using, then substitute the numbers in and solve for your answer. So basically the idea behind uh, answering questions like this is because usually questions that are very straightforward in physics 3.4 are going to require you to um, do a bit of working out still because they're going to be two marks. Now, the reason there are two marks is because one mark comes from using the right formula from the formula sheet and the second mark comes from doing the correct substitution and getting the correct answer. Now, even if you don't get the correct answer, if you've done the correct substitution, you still get that mark because actually, um, I, should prom I should put it like this. You get one mark for using the correct formula and doing the correct substitution and one mark for finding the correct answer. Now, if you stuff up with your calculator and you don't get the correct answer, you can still get one out of two marks instead of zero. So that's why usually we recommend our students to always uh, use the formula from the formula sheet. Now, sometimes if you read the examiner's report, what will happen is a lot, uh, and it's a very, very frequent phenomenon. A lot of times students will use derived formulas that they have on their form on their formula sheet or on their cheat sheet. The idea is that every time you use uh, derived formulas from your cheat sheet, it won't really help you because using derived formulas um using derived formulas is not the best idea because that derived formula from your cheat sheet it's not going to be on the formula sheet and because it's not on the formula sheet it means that the examiners don't have time to don't have time to spend seeing whether you've uh derived the formula correctly they're not going to think okay um, how did this person get a particular value for uh, what I'm talking right now is remember guys there's like r cube on t square is equal to gm on 4 pi square so if you use the derived formula let's say you want to find period and you're using this derived formula and I'm going to write the correct one uh, if you're using 4 pi r cube on uh, gm and if we go to square the pi, obviously you're going to get an incorrect answer at the end. Now, examiners don't really have time to spend. Oh, maybe you guys can't see at that corner. One second. So examiners don't really have time to spend thinking, oh, okay, so for this formula has Alex properly has Alex properly rearranged and made T the subject value, right? Because you might write four pi R cube on GM and you're gonna get obviously the incorrect answer. But if you get the incorrect answer, obviously examiners can't give you that one mark there, right? You lose on that one mark. Now, obviously they can't even give you the mark that's supposed to be for correct formula and correct substitution because on the formula sheet, you're given this formula so you're supposed to substitute values in this formula and then rearrange to find let's say period but if you rearrange for period before um, substituting then you're going to be facing a problem that if you forget to square the pi then you're going to get zero marks 
but if you substitute first if you use the formula that they have already provided in the formula sheet and you substitute first then yes then you will get full marks uh, then you will get at least half the marks it's guaranteed that you're gonna get at least half the marks if you make a mistake in rearrangement that's a different problem that shows that you can't rearrange you can't make period the subject but that doesn't mean you should be uh they should be uh penalizing you for not uh, despite you using the correct formula the most difficult questions to actually attempt are worded questions it is always important to put in dot points and to be concise with worded questions. <coughs> Usually the general structure is that you need to explain the theory related to the question and put the theory in context to the question. A final statement is also necessary. For example, Explain why the normal force and weight force are not an example of Newton's third law where an object is at rest on the surface of the earth. One way to possibly answer this is to make a statement saying Newton's third law states that the force on A, the force A on B is equal to the force that B applies on A. Where object A applies the force on object B, this force must be acting on different objects. The weight force is the result of the Earth's gravitational attraction on the object, whereas the normal force is the result of the Earth's surface pushing the object up. As the normal force and weight force act on the same object, the normal force and weight force cannot be an example of Newton's third law. So the idea here is to usually it's it's kind of difficult to make a blanket statement on how to address it's very difficult to make a blanket statement on how to address theory questions they are a very difficult type of question to tackle but i personally always tell my students just put in some theory explain something and preferably use the formula as well so explain the theory use the formula use the formula related back to the context of the question if you can manage to do that you're going to do relatively well with uh theory questions those are the hardest to uh those are the hardest to attempt now that's how you answer questions in physics so we just talked on how to tackle um we just spoke and and i kind of explained to you how to tackle calculation questions and how to tackle theory questions now it's time to actually explain a bit of theory so let's start with uh, newton's three laws an object will remain at rest or travel with a constant velocity if the net force acting on the object is zero that's newton's first law what does that mean well uh this one is actually a very uh a very tricky part uh, at least how Vika examines it. Usually Vika will say that there is an object traveling at a constant speed by the net force acting on that object. So Vika again will say there is an object, there is a train, there is a car moving at a constant velocity. There is a car moving at a constant velocity. Let's say it's 5 meters per second, but it's constant 5 meters per second. And it will ask you, find... So this is a car. And it will ask you and say, oh, find the net force acting on the car. Now, if the car is moving at a constant velocity, it means that the net force, F net, it's actually equal to zero. Now, why is that? How can a car be moving at a constant velocity and still have a net force equal to zero? That's the case because the thrust force from the engine equals the friction force. So if the engine is 10 newtons of thrust force and there is a 10 newtons of friction force, those forces will cancel each other out. So the net force is equal to zero. And that's why acceleration is equal to zero, right? Because 
force is equal to force i'm going to write here is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration if the net force is equal to zero then acceleration has to equal zero because mass is always different from zero mass can't equal zero right now again this is the scenario where the forces cancel each other out but it doesn't mean the object is moving the object is still moving it's just that the forces have cancelled out that's why the object is moving so this is where most students uh, misinterpret newton's first law they assume that if an object is at rest then that's the only case when the force is equal to zero and if an object is moving then the force has to be greater than zero uh, newton's laws are about the net force not just the force it's about the net force acting on the object it's about the combination it's about what's happening simultaneously with an object that matters that's what newton's law is trying to describe it's describing the motion of an object based on simultaneous forces acting on it when a non-zero net force act on the object the object will accelerate so it's kind of um, the idea here again, if the net force is different, again, non-zero net force, if the net force is different from zero, then the object, sorry, then the object must be, then the object must be accelerating. Why? because the mass is different from zero therefore and if the net force is different from zero acceleration also has to be different from zero too So that's uh, that's the that's the idea behind it. What does that mean in terms of forces? That means that uh, Newton's second law is stating the inverse of what Newton's first law is stating. Newton's second law is saying that well, the net force, the thrust force on the car is greater than the friction force. So the thrust force is 11, 12. So it's something greater than the friction force. It's greater than 10 newtons. That's why there is a net force acting on the car greater than zero. And therefore, the car must be accelerating. But what does it mean for the car to be acceler accelerating? It means that the... It means for a car to be accelerating, it essentially means that the... that the velocity is also changing simultaneously so it's not five meters per second but it's it's increasing exponentially sorry linearly linearly depends actually depends if the object is moving at a constant acceleration then yes the the velocity is going to be linear and uh, acceleration is going to be a constant so usually uh that's the idea if we were to map out what i'm talking about right now uh, with a graph okay i can't seem to clear everything up that's okay If we were to clear, if we were to explain with graphs what's happening, usually uh, this is as the, as an object accelerates, it covers more and more distance. Therefore, its velocity is increasing linearly, but its acceleration is a constant. So this is a really important series of graphs for you to remember um because using these graphs it's actually how we using these graphs it's actually how we we derive the suvat formulas that you're going to see in a moment 
How about Newton's third law? Uh, Newton's third law is funnily enough what people think to be the easiest, so action reaction forces, but it's in fact the hardest law for people to actually apply. The reason for that is because people don't understand that, especially students, they don't understand what action reaction forces are. So if there is a person, if there's a car, okay, standing on the ground, there's usually the weight force that acts on the car straight down right and when we ask students what's the reaction force to the weight force that the earth is applying on the car students will usually reply well it's the normal <laughs> the normal force pushing up and because those two forces are equal to each other they are in opposite directions right so equal to each other in opposite they're equal to each other they're acting in opposite directions they must be action reaction force paired well there is actually a third uh, qualifying criteria for stuff to be action reaction force pairs that qualifying criteria will be uh, the third qualifying criteria would be that those forces must be acting on different objects or they must be of the same type for example both of them need to be weight forces or field forces, which in this case they are not. In this case, we're dealing with the field force and we're dealing with the contact force, which is the normal force. Now, what would be the reaction force to the weight force that the earth is applying on the car downwards? The reaction force to the force that the earth is applying to the car downwards would be uh the force that the car is applying on the earth upwards the weight force it's also weight force so the reaction force to that force it's this force here so it's the weight force that the car is applying on the earth up not the normal force the weight force so these two weight forces are actually action reaction force pairs uh they're equal in magnitude uh, they're acting in opposite directions and they're both field forces now in physics you will learn about a series of different force types you will learn about field forces contact forces a bunch uh, but yeah that's the general idea so far the hardest part is dealing with tension now, tension is kind of applying Newton's, Newton's second and third law, uh, where you find acceleration and you apply it to an individual component. General tips when you get stuck on a force question, draw a force diagram and label the forces. It will help sort things out in your brain. Find the acceleration by looking at the system as a whole and find the tension by looking at one component of the system. Now, despite me uh, reading this to you, you are probably still um, confused on how to actually attempt tension questions because they are genuinely hard questions, right? <laughs> tension questions are the hardest. Let me see if I have a question here. Maybe later. Okay, so tension questions usually relate to springs as well, but tension questions can also be um, they can also be exemplified with connected bodies. So if I were to draw a connected body here, right? If I were to draw a connected body. Uh, and uh, the question is find the tension that's acting on the string here pulling mass 2 um, Given that you know the mass of both mass 1 and mass 2 So if m1 is equal to 1 kilogram and m2 is equal to sorry if m1 is equal to 10 kilogram and m2 is equal to 2 kilogram Find the tension on m2 Usually most students don't really know how to attempt this question because at the end of the day uh, how do you do this question right so the trick here is to find the acceleration when we find acceleration here we're going to assume that there is these two bodies are connected because they are with a string so what we will assume is that the weight force acting on m1 is actually the only force that's acting down on them if we assume negligible, negligible friction forces so what we will do is we will assume that's the case right we will assume that's definitely the case so
so the net force is going to be divided by the mass of both bodies m1 plus m2 because since both of those bodies are connected with each other they're going to be accelerating at the same at the same rate but just because they're accelerating at the same rate does not mean that the individual force acting on each of them is the same. The net force acting on those objects might be the same, but the individual force is not the same. Because they have different masses, right? So they are accelerating at the same rate because the net force acting on them is... Uh, they're accelerating at the same rate because they're connected to each other, but it doesn't mean the individual forces acting on them is the same because the individual force acting on each of this object is going to be equal to the mass of that object multiplied by the acceleration, which is the same. So I will write AC or acceleration of connected bodies. So that's the same acceleration, but the mass of M1 differs from the mass of M2. M1 is five times larger than M2. So to find the value of tension, we need to multiply the mass of M2 by acceleration. So that's, that's kind of the idea. <laughs> now, usually what, what this means is that the net force here is the weight force acting on both. So that's going to be M1G divided by M1 plus M2. And then you can combine these together. You can substitute this one because it's the value of acceleration here. So M1, M2, G divided by M1 plus M2, it's the tension value. Now, that's what tension is. Usually when you combine, uh, sometimes it's good when we combine equations with each other, it makes it really It makes it really easy, but sometimes it's actually combining things together uh, can make it more complicated, right? It requires you to think in a more complex way than just, you know, um, than just seeing. Sometimes when you overthink things, right? Combining equations together is equivalent to overthinking. So when you overthink things, it's not good. It takes longer to actually get the solution. Now, another topic that you guys need to uh, need to address in the, on the exam is projectile motion questions. Now, projectile motion questions are actually the toughest to address by by a by big shot um Okay, so projectile motion questions are definitely the toughest because projectile motion questions require you to uh, analyze an object that is traveling in air. But the object is obviously not going to be uh, not going to be moving in a linear path. It's going to be moving in a path like at an angle as you see a projectile. So the key idea is that the only force acting on the projectile is on the object is gravity excluding air resistance uh, the horizontal and vertical velocities are independent of each other the horizontal velocity is constant whereas the vertical velocity is always changing because there is acceleration due to gravity hence any force or uh, hence any of the constant acceleration formula are applicable so what that means is that first of all we need to clarify the fact that Viga will ask you questions about projectile where uh, the air resistance is equal to it's actually equal to zero uh, you are only qualitatively required to comment on how air resistance affects the projectile. So you are only qualitatively required on how air resistance affects the projectile. How does air resistance affect the projectile? Air resistance reduces the range 
and the height that the projectile can reach that's what air resistance does so that's a one point from the study design that we've addressed now how about the weight force well in that case if we're going to analyze the weight force then we're going to have to then we are going to then we're going to deal with with dividing the motion of the object into its both vertical and horizontal components so i usually divide it into the y-axis component and onto the x-axis component on the x-axis first of all let's discuss about the fact that we have a constant velocity so the velocity that the object has will always be the same throughout the entire path because there's no force acting horizontally on the object after it leaves the projectile so in mid air there's nothing acting horizontally on the object there's only again we're assuming air resistance is equal to zero so there's only the weight force acting down on the projectile um so if we know to if we know the period then we can find the range why how can we find the range well range is just distance and we know that velocity is equal to distance over time so this is the only thing velocity is equal to displacement over time so we know this is the only th formula that we can use with um with the horizontal component of uh the motion for a uh for projectile for projectile questions how about uh the vertical component of the motion the vertical component of the motion is a little bit more complicated because for the vertical component of the motion we have to focus on both we have to focus on both we have to focus on both the uh we have to yeah we have to focus on uh the velocity a little bit more so the velocity is actually equal to uh u sine theta just like for the velocity of the horizontal component it's e it's actually equal to u cosine theta So this one should be equal to cos theta, u cos theta, or whatever theta of the projectile is. Uh, for um, the vertical component, there is also acceleration, which is equal to 9.8. And then we also have to deal with height and time. Now, time is the only variable that links both the horizontal and the vertical component of motion. But because there is acceleration on the vertical axis and that acceleration due to gravity we are, have assumed is constant then we can use suvat formulas for these component suvat formulas for uh, for the vertical component of the motion those are tough questions to deal with projectile motion questions usually uh yes uh usually what vika will ask you which is i think the hardest one to kind of answer is uh find the find the velocity the final velocity of the no object and the angle uh, so before it reaches the end so it's asking you to find this vector here now the way you find that vector is by finding by using pythagoras theorem you find the horizontal velocity which is constant all the way throughout so you've probably been given that and then you find the final velocity by using suvat so after you find those two you can use pythagoras theorem to say well a square plus b square is equal to c square and then you can say c is equal to square root a square and b square well, well what's a square uh a square again was the 
a final velocity, so vertical velocity Vf square plus a final horizontal velocity, which is Vx square, right? And that's how you find the final velocity at the diagonal. Now, how do you find if the horizontal velocity has already been given to you? How do you find the vertical velocity? Well, the vertical velocity you can use SUVAT, as I said. So, usually you can use V is equal to U plus AT, or you can use V square is equal to U square plus 2AX. Any of these formulas you can use to find the value of velocity there, or in other words, the vertical component of velocity. Okay, so that's, that's about it when it comes to projectiles. Projectiles are relatively hard. Um, yeah, uh, with projectiles, obviously, you will also be asked a question when they're going to shoot a projectile and it's going to re reach a particular height. Like, they're going to shoot a projectile and they're going to stop the height of the projectile here. So it's not a symmetrical path, right? So what you're going to do in that case is you can use this formula, ut plus half a t square to find the height uh, that the projectile has traveled, right? So to find the height above the ground. But if the projectile is going like that, and they're asking what's the height here, see now that's a tricky question to ask. Uh, okay, that's a tricky question to ask, right? You're going to use still this formula, you're still going to use that formula, but you, you're supposed to get a negative value. If they're asking, so if the projectile is being launched from, from a platform and it reaches a certain height here, then you're still going to use this formula, but you must make sure you get a negative value for that because this will only give you the drop from the original position of the projectile. So this formula here, X, only gives you Again, I will repeat this again. It will assume that the starting point of the projectile is ground point, right? It will assume it's level zero. And then anything below that, you should get a negative value. If it's not negative, then you've done something wrong. Again, that's the key point. And if Vika, in this case, asks you for the height above the ground, and let's say the ground is here, what you have to do is you have to find the value of X, which is the drop from the starting point of the projectile, and then you have to subtract from the total height to find of the projectile, the height of the platform. You have to subtract X to find the height above which, again, the projectile has hit, let's say, a, a board. Let's say there's a board here that the projectile has hit, right? So you have to be very careful. You have to actually understand what, the, what those values actually mean because these formulas, these SUVAT formulas are actually describing a graph a graph of x-axis and y-axis where the projectile starts at zero and it's you can see from the equation this is the equation of a parabola right it's an inverse parabola equation so mm, you have to be careful with that now uh, let's talk about springs Springs are one of the worst done topics on the exam because they're actually quite hard to understand. And it comes up pretty much every year. Today, uh, we will focus on oscillating springs where the spring is hung from the ceiling and, there, and the ceiling and there is a match mass attached to it. There are two perspectives when looking at springs. We're looking at the force from the spring and the weight force and the energy at all points. So when we're looking at oscillating springs, you need to understand there are three types of energies which are involved. So the total energy of the spring is gonna be the same. Uh, you need to understand first of all that the energy of a system uh, cannot be created, it cannot be destroyed. If the system is closed, it can only be transformed from one form into another. Um, there are three types of energy. There is the weight, uh, there is the uh, gravitational potential energy, there is kinetic energy, and there is uh, elastic potential energy.
Um, with let me double check am I recording or not <laughs> well it seems to be recording so for 36 minutes All right. So, um, how, how does this work? Well, basically, Well, basically, uh, oscillating springs, we have, they're going up and down. Obviously, I said there are three types of energy, gravitational potential energy, uh, kinetic energy, and elastic potential energy. So at the very top, if we are looking at an oscillating spring, and I'm going to draw it here. So at the very top, uh, obviously there is maximum gravitational potential energy because again, this is the maximum height that the spring can achieve. A kinetic energy is equal to zero because the spring isn't moving and elastic potential energy is also equal to zero because the spring hasn't been stretched or extended. It's still at its resting length. The force acting on the spring at the moment is actually constant because it's equal to the weight force. The weight force is the only force acting on the object at this time. The force due to the spring is equal to zero. Uh, in the middle, what's happening? In the middle, the spring has actually reached maximum kinetic energy because it has reached maximum velocity. During this process, though, it has lost half of its gravitational potential energy and it has gained half of its kinetic of its elastic potential energy. How about at the bottom? At the bottom now, there is no more height. We assume that this is a ground level. So the object has lost all of its gravitational potential energy. All of its gravitational potential energy has been converted into um, elastic potential energy. So this is the maximum stretch of the spring. It has zero kinetic energy and zero gravitational potential energy. So if at the top all of its energy is gravitational potential energy and at the bottom all of its energy is elastic potential energy, you need to understand that you need to understand that All of this gravitational potential energy has been converted into elastic potential energy. That's that's all that's happening. Um, but they're the same, so they're equal in. 
they are equal in magnitude. If we were to graph it now, I, I'm sure there's a graph on the other page. Graph, if we were to graph it, again, it's the, I wish I had like a laser here. So again, it's this gravitational potential en uh, uh, energy that has been lost from the top. It's a maximum has been completely lost and at the bottom. Now we have zero gravitational potential energy but we have maximum, we have this maximum stretch of the spring, therefore there is maximum elastic potential energy. Midway through though, we see that there is maximum kinetic energy. So kinetic energy as the spring stretches reaches the maximum and then it slows down again. Velocity, acceleration is equal to zero actually midway through because the velocity also takes this shape of the, the graph of the velocity also takes this shape. So if you were to find a stationary point, if you were to find acceleration, uh, it would actually be equal to zero when the velocity reaches a peak. And because that is when the stretch, that is when the pulling force by the spring exceeds uh, the weight force. So that's when the forces balance each other out. Now, what has not been drawn here is actually one of the most important forces, the total force of, or the mechanical force of the system. So the total force of the system, uh, total force, I mean total energy over the system or the mechanical energy of the system is actually a constant and it should add up at every point to reach a constant value at the top. So let's let's draw that now. All of it. Should add up to constant. Oh no, what's happening? Okay. Let's go. So it all should add up to, right, the energies should add up together and it should be a constant. Now the hard graph to look at here is actually the one people do not expect. The hard graph to look at here, and most people don't even analyze this graph, it's actually the force graph. The force graph is an insanely hard graph to actually understand. So the, the weight force is obviously a constant, right? But there is something called the force by the spring which is increasing linearly as the it's increasing linearly as the spring is being extended now it reaches a point where the force by the spring equals the weight force so if the weight force is pushing that pu pulling down and the spring force is pulling up those two cancel out and equal to a net force of zero they're, they're equal to a net force of zero eventually the spring force will exceed the weight force and this is where the net force now increases beyond zero. This is also when, at this point, it's also when velocity has reached the peak and now it's starting to reduce because, uh, because the object is now going into negative uh, acceleration, it's deaccelerating. Uh, yeah. Or no, that's a bad way to put it. The object, when an object is deaccelerating, or uh, it's losing acceleration, uh, velocity is still increasing. It's when an object is accelerating in the opposite direction. Okay, that's a better way to put it. Yes, not when it's deaccelerating. Deacceleration is up until this point. 
this is the acceleration but the orb the velocity okay this is where most people get confused the acceleration is up until this point when it comes to velocity then after this point then we have negative acceleration and velocity keeps increasing yep so that's what you have to deal with with springs that's what you have to be able to also explain now let's talk about properties of circular motion Okay. So circular motion is circular motion is interesting. I'm blacking out a bit, but circular motion is interesting. Uh, circular motion requires you to understand. Uh, how to draw the forces yes that's what i was going to say so the problem with circular motion is that usually what vika will do is almost every time every single year and every single year there are students that get this wrong vika will ask you to draw here vika will ask you to draw out um the forces acting on an object right uh, when it's moving so let me let me explain a bit better uh you're going to be required to state that the velocity is going at the tangential path but you also have to draw it because that's the only way they know you actually know what you're talking about then acceleration and net force have to be drawn going towards the center of the circle so that way again they know that you know what you're talking about because it's very easy to say oh centripetal force is force uh, going causing an object to move in a circular motion that's what the centripetal force is but do you actually understand what it means right do you actually understand that it's something that pulls an object towards the center of a circle that's why it causes it to rotate now with centripetal motion guys you need to understand that the centripetal force which is equal to m mv square on r it's not an actual force uh, it is an actual force but it's not a force by itself it's actually a representation a different representation of another force it's the same thing it's the same statement for another force it's the synonymous of another force for example the the, the weight force can be a centripetal force on a roller coaster the friction force can be the centripetal force for a car going around a roundabout so they are synonymous they're one and the same but the beauty behind it is that now we can equate the weight force to the centripetal force we can equate the frictional force to the centripetal force we can find the value of that particular force just by using centripetal force equations because they're synonymous they're one and the same now the important bit here is about acceleration so the formula for acceleration is equal to v square on r this is what we call centripetal acceleration and because of this we say that the centripetal force is mv square on r because force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration now you do not need to understand where this formula was derived from it's actually quite difficult unless you really like math and yeah you can have a go at it uh, but you you're gonna learn how to do that in uni uh, in uni calculus yep um part of the part of the equation that you need to know how to do yourself is this part here so where did they get four pi square uh, four pi square r on t square well usually uh what they're gonna do is they're gonna use the parameter and then they're gonna divide it by so what is velocity velocity is equal to distance over time right so what's distance? Distance is the parameter, right? So it's equal to 2 pi r divided by period. Cool. So if you were to inject this value 
into the formula for acceleration you're squaring everything so you're saying two pa two square pi square on r square is equal to t square so you're gonna end up with four pi pi square r square on t square but then you have to multiply it by one over r so the radius cancels out and that's why you end up four pi square r on t square usually again Viga will ask you to draw this out and usually uh to draw out the tangential velocity and the forces going towards the center and usually you will be asked to usually you will be asked to identify for example in a roller coaster uh the weight force being the centripetal force see or in a roundabout the frictional force being the centripetal force because circular motion can occur on a horizontal on a horizontal plane where uh, the speed of the object is constant and the velocity of the object is always changing but it can also occur in a vertical plane so circular motion can definitely occur in a vertical plane at the bottom of the circle you need to understand that the normal force is greater than the weight force that is why there's the net force going upwards and the net force in this case represents the circular circular motion force the centripetal force and at the top of the circle is the weight force that's greater than the normal force that's why the object will still keep going in circles Okay. Up, guys it's cold today really cold so the normal force so let's let's talk a bit about this this what we see here so yes this is circular motion occurring uh, what we are looking at but there's also some phenomena some other phenomena that's happening here for example As we said, the normal force is greater at the bottom. I'm going to take out my laser. The normal force, we said, is greater at the bottom than it is at the top. What does that mean? That means that at the bottom, if the normal force is greater than at the top, it means that an object feels heavier. So if you were to be standing on the car there, you would feel heavier. And then the normal force, if it's the normal force is less at the top than it is at the bottom, then you're going to feel lighter. So, 
Why is that important? That is important because we need to understand what our perception of weight is. Your perception of weight and my perception of weight is actually the normal force. So the normal force is what helps us perceive our own weight. That's all there is to it, actually. Uh, so if the normal force is equal to zero, I would feel weight weightless. So if I'm in free fall, if I jump out of an aeroplane and I'm in free fall uh, before I open the parachute or anything, I would feel weightless. There's nothing, nothing at all pushing me up. So there's no, no reason for me to think I have weight. The only reason we think we have weight is because, again, we're standing on the ground and the ground is pushing us up. Now, our perception of weight is actually, funnily enough, the right perception of weight because usually we're standing on the ground right and the ground is pushing us up with the exact same amount of force that we're pushing it down so the normal force on the ground up on us is equal to the normal force that we are applying on the ground down now usually this means that our perception of weight is correct for most of the time but when we go onto an elevator or when we go on a roller coaster or when we drive down the hill and up on hill when we drive down all of a sudden the normal force will be much greater than at the top and when that normal force increases we feel heavier and when that normal force reduces we feel lighter we call this apparent weight so apparent weight like apparent uh, for an apparent moment for a short period of time uh we feel heavier than we should feel and then for another short period of time we feel lighter than we should feel for example at the top of the circle why because the normal force again is less at the top or the normal force is greater at the bottom that's how our perception of our weight changes Apparent weightlessness again occurs when the normal force is equal to zero and usually, funnily enough, we can find the velocity of an object if the object is also moving at the circle and that's going to be equal to square root rg. Uh, and this formula can be used in circular motion when the normal force is equal to zero. It's just a shortcut. There's also something else tr called true weightlessness. That true weightlessness occurs when the weight force is actually equal to zero. And the weight force equals actually zero only and only in deep space. Because for the weight force to equal zero, it means that the acceleration due to gravity must equal to zero. Right? Because we say mass is force is equal to mg. Right? So for the weight force to actually equal zero, the only possible solution will be for the gravitational field shrinks to equal to zero. But we know that can only happen in deep space when we have escaped the Earth's gravitational pull. Now with circular motion, we also have to look at backed tracks. So, uh, like a velodrome, where cyclists, uh, where cyclists move in. That is still circular motion. It's called, again, uh, circular motion in a velodrome, or backed track, where the centripetal force is supplied not by the friction force anymore, but by, completely by the normal force. Because if you were to shift the weight force parallel up, you'd get this. So if you were to use vector addition, you would get a centripetal force going straight to the center. In this case, we call this angle that enables us to obtain centripetal force simply from um, simply from the normal force. We call this angle the. The, the ideal angle and we call it the design speed or the design speed angle because also the velocity of the object will be of a particular value so in order to find that angle we say tan theta is equal to v square on R, rg and to find the angle itself to find this bad boy here we say theta is uh, we say theta is equal to inverse tan of v square on rg Okay, so the only force acting on the satellite is the weight force. Again, this acts as a centripetal force. 
All those uh, satellites are in free fall, and this occurs when the only force <coughs> acting on the object is the weight force. This means that no normal force acts on the object, and therefore the object feels apparently weightless. Also note that because the force acting on the satellite is perpendicular to its motion, no work is done on it. That's a good point. All right, a couple of quick questions now. We're moving on to another topic. We're moving on to fields. And that is low. So let's look at this question. Samir and Mark construct a simple alternator as shown in figure 21. Describe the orientation of the rotating cone when the magnitude of the EMF is at maximum. Give reasons for your answer. Ooh, I will give you guys a minute to think about this. So when do you think the magnitude of EMF would be a maximum? Let's do a quick revision first. What EMF is. So usually you guys learn about a coil going between two magnets and there being magnetic field lines going between those two magnets from north pole to south pole. Now be careful when you draw magnetic field lines and don't do what I just did. Never cross those magnetic field lines. Can they go through from North Pole to South Pole? And we say that the magnetic flux is going to be equal to A multiplied by B. A multiplied by magnetic field strength. That's what flux is. And we say flux, in order to change flux, we can change the area or we can change the magnetic field strength. EMF, on the other hand, we say is the number of turns multiplied by the change in magnetic field strength divided by change in time. So based on, based on this information, when do you think that there will be a maximum EMF? Give reasons. So just a minute to think about it. Hmm, let's see if you guys can get this right. Okay, I'll give you guys the answer. The answer is... The answer is when the coal is actually oriented flat at this position. Why? Well, maximum EMF will occur when there is the maximum change in flux. A maximum change in flux only occurs after all of the magnetic field lines going through up to no magnetic field lines going through so from all the magnetic field lines going through the coal up to no magnetic field lines going through the coal now when it comes to a flux time graph and this is why only 15 percent of the people got this question correct because when it comes to a flux time graph 
it's gonna be a sine graph right but an emf time graph is also a sine graph So this would be a coarse graph. All right, so let's address the elephant in the room. What is the difference between RMS voltage and peak voltage? So RMS voltage is going to be equal to peak voltage divided by square root two, and RMS current is going to be equal to peak current divided by square root two. So um, why do we do this? So that's that that's the elephant in the room. Why do we do this? Why do we why do we divide by square root two? The idea is that with generators, so we've learned in physics about motors and generators. Motors are when we convert electrical energy into mechanical energy, and generators are when we convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. Now this electrical energy output depends whether we're using a commutator or whether we are using sp split rings. A split ring commutator or slip rings when we are using split rings or a commutator a split ring commutator we are getting a dc output a direct current output but when we are using slip ring commutators we are getting an alternating current output these are two different types of outputs um However, how do we com compare the two? Because direct output is always a constant value, but alternating current output it's always changing, right? Like how do you how do you compare? Let's say you're going to get a you, let's say you're going to get a generator. You're gonna buy a generator because you're gonna go on camping for a while. How are you gonna compare a generator that says oh the DC generator ten volts, and then how are you gonna compare the DC generator ten volts to another AC generator which says peak fifteen volts? Are you just gonna buy the fifteen volt generator just because it says peak fifteen volts? What if it's peak eleven volts? Are you gonna buy the peak eleven volts AC generator just because it has eleven volts? How do you know the DC voltage isn't more economic than the AC voltage? You can't compare them because it says peak voltage, but the voltage is going to vary with an AC output. So you need to calculate an average in order to compare the AC generator from DC generator when you're going to buy them from the shop. 
right? That's the whole idea why we divide by square root 2. And that's why we call it root mean square. We divide the peak voltage by square root 2, we divide the peak current by square root 2, and consequently, we divide the peak power by square root 2. And when we do that, we can compare actually the power output of an AC voltage generator and a DC generator and make the right purchase. So again, it's just a way of finding the average. Now we can't just add up all the values and divide by the total number of values because if we do that, obviously the average would be zero. So instead scientists just use square root two as a means to address uh, RMS voltage and the comparison between uh, a DC supply and an AC supply. Now let's talk about Lenz's law for a bit. With Lenz's law, it's a very interesting uh, situation. With Lenz's law, we usually concentrate on the Bacow method. That's what I call it. I call it the Bacow method. Bacow, B-A-C-O. Cool. What's happening before, after, what the changes and the opposite change that will be induced. So the definition of Lenz's law is that any current induced in a loop will be in the direction so that flux it creates will oppose the change in flux that produced it. Breaking, breaking down this definition, we get that Lenz's law is used to determine the direction of the current created when there is a change in flux, which induces EMF, which induces current in turn. The aim of the current is to create a flux that opposes the flux that induced it. So, if we are saying that there is a coil here and a magnet, and this is the north pole, and then the magnet approaches the coil, what will happen is, so this is the first scenario, the second scenario is that the magnet has approached the coil more, and that's the north pole. What should happen here now is that there are more magnetic field lines going through the coil than there were before. So before there is few magnetic field lines, after there is more magnetic field lines, the change is an increase in magnetic field lines. So what's the opposite? There should be a decrease in magnetic field lines. There should be a decrease in magnetic field lines. That's what the change is. So, So, a current that is induced here will be a current that means magnetic field lines going, will induce magnetic field lines going in the opposite directions. So your thumb should point in the opposite direction and then your fingers should be curling, like a chin-up grip. Therefore, current will be going that way, so into the page. Uh, so that if you look at from the side of the North Pole, if you take the point of view of the North Pole, that should be anti-clockwise. So that was Lenz's law. Now, all that these slides are saying is that uh, Lenz's law can be used to also kind of, it's the inverse of what's happening in a In our th third right hand rule, basically. Now, I kind of drew this graph before, but I'm redrawing it again to, to emphasize and for you guys to take home the point that an EMF graph is the derivative of a flux time graph. You really need to remember that. 
and the peak of an emf graph which i did not show you before and that's my mistake is when the flux graph reaches a zero so that's its peak and the peak of a flux graph is a zero for an emf graph right so let's look at another question just for fun A model is set up as a DC generator with an output connected to a voltmeter and oscilloscope via a commuted as shown in figure 13. With a coil of side length 4 cm and 10 turns and a uniform magnetic field of 2 times 10 spark negative 3 tesla. Okay, this is a good one. The shaft of the coil makes 2 complete revolutions per second. Calculate the magnitude of the average voltage as shown in the voltmeter during one quarter of a revolution so you're working. Hmm. Let's break this down. And let's see why only 33% of people got full marks. Two complete revolutions per second, so frequency is equal to two hertz. Not twenty one hertz, two hertz. So period is equal to one over two. So find the voltage during a quarter of a revolution. Okay. So I will give you guys only a minute to look at this before I give you the answer.
All right, so more than enough time. So here's the trick: it's asking for a quarter of a revolution, but it has given you the full period. So when we're talking about EMF or voltage, same thing. It's equal to n multiplied by change in flux over change in time. So n is actually equal to 10 multiplied by change in flux, which is a multiplied by b. Area is uh, ooh, how much is area? Oh, it's a square coil. So we're going to assume the side length is 4 centimeters for each side. So that's going to be 0 0.04 multiplied by 0 0.04. So yeah, that's going to be 16 times 10 to the power of negative 4. So the area is going to be 16 times 10 to the power of negative 4 multiplied by 2 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which is Tesla. Divided by the change in over time. So it's not going to be, it's going to be the quarter of the period, which is 1 on 2. So it's going to be 0 0.5 divided by 4. So all of these multiply by one on four. Or in other words, you take the four up. So no matter how you do it, you're going to get a certain value. Where's my calculator? Yeah. Okay, I don't think I got a good value. Let's try that again. 10 times. 16 times 10 to the power of negative 4 multiplied by 2 times 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 0 0.5 divided by 4. Yep, so the answer is 0 0.000256 volts. So 2.56 times 10 to the power of negative 4 volts. A bit low, I was expecting higher. But it is what it is. Okay. So... What else there is to discuss about this topic of unit 3? Well, something else we have to discuss is what are transformers. So transformers and what, why are they used? So basically the idea is with circuits, 
if you've learned some equations, some basic equations in uh, some basic equations in physics. So one of those basic equations was one of those basic equations was that voltage is equal to I multiplied by R and that power is equal to I multiplied by V. However, if you substitute the value of voltage for IR, we get I is equal to by R. So power loss is equal to I square R. So power is equal to I square R, which means power loss in transmission lines is equal to current multiplied uh, current square multiplied by resistance. Now, usually there is electricity which is being generated at the generator side, right? Um, it can be generated in different forms using fossil fuels, using renewable energy, anything. It, energy is being produced there. Now that energy is going to be there's going to be a lot of power which needs to be transmitted to our homes. Now as the power is being transmitted from one location to another location, a lot of energy will actually a lot of power will actually be lost in the transmission lines because the transmission lines are not that effective, right? There's going to be resistance in the transmission lines as well. It's not the resistance only in our house. It's not the resistance only in the lamp in my room or the or in my laptop. There's the resistance everywhere, and power will be lost when it goes through that resistance in the coils now from an economics perspective from a profit perspective we want to minimize as much power loss as possible uh, it's just more efficient to do so and you can deliver more power for less cost so it's more uh, economic more it's cheaper uh, and this is where transformers come into play so if power loss is equal to i square multiplied by r we can use coils which uh, so we can use coils which are lighter, which are uh, better conductors to reduce resistance. But another way to do things is to reduce them current, because we re if we reduce the current by a factor of two, that's reducing power loss by a factor of four, instead of reducing the resistance by a factor of two, which reduces total power loss by only a factor of two as well. So how do we um, increase current going into the transmission lines? Well, we can use a transformer. Now, a transformer utilizes all the concepts that we have learned so far. A transformer is a device. It's a device that has, a prim uh, has an iron core. And in this iron core, we have like a primary rod and a secondary rod. In the primary rod, there is what we we call primary coils and the secondary rod we call it secondary coils now the primary coils are attached or the primary turns are attached to the generator the secondary ones are attached to the transmission lines now if the number of coils in the secondary if the number of turns in the secondary coil is greater than the number of turns in the primary coil then the voltage at which we're transmitting the same amount of power is going to be higher the reason for that is because voltage is equal to n multiplied by change in flux over change in time which is basically exactly what we did so what we're doing is to transmit the same amount of power we're increasing the amount of voltage at which we're transmitting the power at but at the same time reducing the amount of current using the transformer because the number of turns of secondary to primary turns it's proportional with voltage but disproportional with current that is as we increase the amount of voltage at which at which we're transmitting the power we're reducing the amount of current at which which we trans trans at which we're transmitting this amount of power therefore power loss reduces so that's the whole point of the transformer we call it a step up transformer the type of transformer that increases the voltage that we're supplying and a step down transformer the transformer that reduces the voltage at which we're supplying the power at we use step down transformers actually close to our homes so we step up the voltage a step up transformer at the generation side so we we minimize power loss in the transmission lines and then we use a step down transformer before power comes into our homes otherwise all our appliances will blow up basically so transformers uh, work on the idea of alternating flux and they cannot work with a dc supply they can only work with an ac supply that is why ac is used a lot nowadays That's why it's so cold in my room, it's like a freezing. Ooh.
All right. So just a quick review of a little bit of special relativity. I know you guys miss it a lot. So in special relativity, we've learned about time dilation and length contraction, and we've learned about the Lorentz factor. So the idea is the Lorentz factor is something that is equal to uh, one on square root one minus v square on c square. And uh, time dilation is the idea where we are dilating time, proper time, by a factor of gamma, and length contraction is when we are dividing proper length by a factor of gamma. Oh, you guys can't see it there. One second. Okay, let's do this here. Yeah. Okay. Um. What I was saying, yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, I wanted to say, sadly, sadly, <laughs> Vega will ask you to rearrange to find the velocity when it comes to special relativity uh, questions. So uh, let's do that now, actually, and you can have it on your cheat sheet. So velocity should be. Um, so we square both sides. We get gamma square here. We get one on. Uh, 1 minus v square on c square therefore we get on the other side we get we flip it actually so we get 1 minus v square on c square is equal to 1 on y square um, so negative v square on c square is equal to 1 on y square minus 1 v square on c square is equal to 1 minus 1 on y square so v is equal to square root 1 minus 1 on y square c square okay so square root c square one on minus one on y square so it would be a good idea to have that on your cheat sheet just in case we got this have a tendency to ask that type of question quite frequently so if i were you guys i'd make sure i have it there All right. 
So at time dilation and length contraction, just make sure you uh, uh, you find proper time and then you make sure you find proper time and then you also need to make sure you find proper length. Uh, I think the idea of the twin paradox helps a lot with that. But anyways. A really concept that you do definitely need to never forget is relativistic mass. So, uh, relativistic mass is basically the same thing as proper time and relativistic, uh, relativistic time and re relativistic length. But the idea with relativistic mass is that um, mass can increase as an object goes really fast. And the reason you learn this is because you want to learn about the cosmic speed limit. So as an object goes faster and faster and faster, its mass will dilate. Just like time dilation, mass can also dilate at, uh, when something is moving close to the speed of light. Now, as mass gets higher and higher and higher, obviously an object can't accelerate anymore and it slows down. That's why we say, remember, force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration. Acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. So there is an inverse relationship between acceleration and mass uh, for the same amount of force which is being applied. So what's gonna happen is, um, there is a limit uh, which we cannot cross and that is the cosmic speed limit. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So that's how we came to that conclusion. That's why when it comes to this type of graphs, usually they will come up in the form of multiple choice questions for you on your VK exam. You need to make sure that you do not forget that part. Uh, this is, the same applies with the gamma value. I don't think they have it, but the same applies with the gamma value. Also for Q&A, guys, feel free to ask me Feel free to ask me any question on the chat, on the live chat. Yeah, and this is where uh, then Einstein's equation kick, kick in. So Einstein came along and said, well, since mass is relativistic, we're going to come up with the resting energy of a mass, and that's going to be m multiplied by c squared. So any this is the energy equivalence mass energy equivalence equation or Einstein's equation where it says that any amount of mass can actually be equated to a certain amount of energy if you were to inhaliate that mass and in order to find the amount of energy which is stored in a certain amount of mass we uh, multiply that mass by the speed of light squared as an object is moving obviously that mass gains kinetic energy and the new mass will be gamma m zero right so what's the energy at that particular velocity it will be gamma m zero c square so how much kinetic energy has been gained from the object moving well that would be gamma m zero c square minus m zero c square where m zero is the resting mass so that would be one minus gamma minus one m c square so that would be the kinetic energy that would be the value of the kinetic energy so the total energy of an object which is moving will be the kinetic energy as it says it plus the resting energy so it would be y gamma mc square so again we found or in other words we know the total energy of the object at the end we know the total energy of the object at the beginning how much energy has been gained is the kinetic energy y gamma minus one m zero six square so it's just a matter of perspective total energy is equal to rest energy which is this energy plus kinetic energy so you already have all the variables and that's how you get each of them so this is just a rearrangement to find the same thing all over again there's no need to concentrate on it a lot okay
let's focus a little bit on Young's double slit experiment and the photoelectric effect. So these two are kind of a tricky one. Have a look at the slits and explain what's happening. What do you see there? Okay, so Man, it's so cool. So uh Young's double slit experiment. So with Young's double slit experiment basically it's kind of summarizing everything that we've learned about waves. Uh, with waves, we've learned about the principle of diffraction. So we said that as stuff goes through a slit, it will diffract. Right? We've also learned about the principle of superposition. So if two waves interact with one another, uh, they have the same wave, uh, interact with one another, but they're going in opposite directions. At the midpoint, they will add up to become something greater. So they will constructively interfere or they will destructively interfere if they're going in opposite directions, but their amplitudes are also oriented in opposite directions. They will destructively interfere. Perfect destructive interference when the two waves overlap and there's nothing left. That's perfect destructive interference. So Young's double slit experiment basically is an experiment that Young conducted a long time ago. He was basically thinking, well, at the time people were unsure whether light was a particle or whether it was a wave. So that's, that's the dilemma that people were trying to figure out. Is particle a light or is, uh, is light a particle or is it a wave? So what Young did is he, he set up a very simple experiment. He used slits, two slits, and then he started shining light through the slits on the back of a screen so as light is shining through the two slits hitting the back of a screen um, basically uh, Young made uh, hypothesized that well if there is a fringe pattern uh, okay if there if light were to be a particle and it goes through the slits there it's like a bullet shooting through two holes right it should only make leave two imprints right if you shoot a bullet through each of them you're only gonna have two bands however as light was shown through young discovered that there is a fringe pattern and that fringe pattern can only and that fringe pattern can only and only exist if there is constructive and destructive interference occurring simultaneously So that explains the fringe pattern. Constructive and destructive interference occurring simultaneously, as you can see there. So there is nodes and anti-nodes. Constructive interference occurs when there are nodes, and destructive interference occurs when there are anti-nodal lines. As you can see there.
Now... The only way uh, that constructive and destructive interference can occur is if there is diffraction from each of the gaps. That's the only way it can it can happen. But both, <laughs> yeah, so this is what was, I was trying to say, both constructive and destructive, so diffraction and constructive and destructive interference are wave phenomena. So the only way that light can produce a fringe pattern is if light is a wave. So, so cold. So, uh, that's what the result was, and Young was satisfied, satiated. He said, "What light is, light is the way." Then, uh, kind of Vika asks you to find out uh, whether at each point there's going to be constructive or destructive interference, and what's the path difference. And you can calculate the path difference as the distance from the second slit to point P minus the distance from the first slit to point P. So, path difference is going to be n multiplied by uh, wavelength. So if the path difference is going to be a multiple of the wavelength of light, then there's going to be constructive interference. And if the path difference is going to be uh, not multiple of the wavelength, so n minus a half multiplied by a wavelength, that will be destructive interference. Uh, you can actually use this to calculate the path difference. So you can use the inverse as well. And uh, that can help you because if Vika asks you, well, what's going to be the path difference of the first band, second dark band, and so on and so forth, you can calculate the path difference that way. Um, oh, also, another thing that kind of Vika might ask you um, is the fringe spacing stuff. So fringe spacing is essentially what is the difference from the center of one broadband, so from here to another broadband from here, right? In other words, um, yeah, that's fringe spacing. So how far apart are the fringes from one another? So uh, how do we do that? So the fringe spacing is essentially going to be calculated as the wavelength of the light multiplied by the length in meters, which is the distance from one slate to the screen at the back, divided by the distance between the two slits. So the fringe spacing here is going to be wavelength multiplied by length divided by the distance between the two slits. Now, this is the photoelectric effect experiment. So let's talk about the photoelectric effect a little bit. So the photoelectric effect, we're not going to go through all the questions. Uh, sorry for that. You have them in the slides. Uh, you can ask me questions. You can go through, the, uh, through those. But let's check the time. Before we talk about the photoelectric effect, how much time I have left. Um, yeah, approximately 10 minutes. So we can finish in five. Or five to six. Yeah, okay. Let's go. Uh, the photoelectric effect, well, 
there is another person who came along, another experimenter, and he said, well, we are not convinced that that's the case, right? We are not convinced that light is a wave. Light might be a particle. We still don't know. So he set up an experiment when he was shining light through, uh, when he was shining light at the cathode, and light of different fre frequencies and light of different intensities. If electrons were to be ejected from the cathode onto the anode, and that would be detected by the uh, by the ammeter, then uh, it's the case that light might be a wave, but it also might be a particle, right? If so, the idea is that if uh, back in the day, people knew that light carried energy, right? It's, it's, it's radiation. It carries energy. The thing is, how does it carry this energy? Does it carry it because it is a particle? Or does it carry this energy because it is a wave? If it carries energy and it gives that energy to the electrons and it ejects electrons from cathode to anode, that's good. It proves that light has energy. But if it's the intensity of light that affects how much energy is being transferred through the system, which is going to be measured by the variable voltage, then that's going to show that light is a wave because the intensity which is measured by the amplitude of the wave determines the energy of the wave for example a tsunami has more energy than a, s a simple wave whereas uh, if light were to be a particle the amount of energy will be determined by the frequency then so when they set up this experiment they were testing light of different frequencies and at different intensities of the same light to see what was the impact and they realized that when they changed the intensity of light there was a change in the current but when they changed the frequency there was a change in energy therefore they came to the conclusion that this is the opposite of what we would predict if light were to be a wave if light were to be a wave then it would be indeed the intensity of light how bright the light is that would determine the energy being transferred through the system but in fact it was the frequency that determined how much energy was going through there as measured by the variable voltage supply which is the stopping voltage so if you go through the observations basically it was concluded that According to the wave model, all frequencies of light should be eventually able to emit photoelectrons because if it's a wave, over time, energy will be enough energy will be carried to the cathode. But our observation was that there is a frequency called the threshold frequency that below which there will be no photoelectrons emitted. According to the wave model, above the threshold frequency, increasing the frequency increases the current. But it was the opposite again. It was above the threshold frequency increasing the frequency increases the stopping voltage because for a particle it's not the intensity that matters it's the frequency that matters right particle means frequency affects energy wave means intensity affects energy not frequency according to the wave model increasing the intensity of light increases the kinetic energy but according to the particle model increasing the intensity increases the number of photoelectrons it increases current so up until now, there have been three observations that prove that light is a particle and that light is not a um, wave. The fourth, uh, which is also a really important one, the fourth observation is that photoelectrons are released with some time delay, when in fact photoelectrons are released instantaneously. So there is also an explanation of each observation that I put on the slides for you guys to read in your own time. Keep in mind that this was all graphed using this kinetic energy. So uh, different, cathode, different uh, cathodes can be made up of different metals. Uh, because energy of light is times constant multiplied by frequency, every single graph will have the same uh, gradient, but the intersection at the x-axis will be the threshold frequency and the intersection with the y-axis will be the work function, which is the amount of energy required to escape the cathode, right? So that's what this equation is there for. It's like, uh, a linear equation, right? Like y is equal to mx plus c. On this graph, it's basically used to show that as you increase the frequency, you're going to shift the graph backwards, but if you increase intensity, you're going to shift it up. Then eventually, Einstein came along with his friends and they came up with the electron diffraction patterns, and you're going to see a lot of those, where they concluded the wave particle duality model, where both wave where light can be both a wave and a particle at the same time and then they came up with the, the broly wavelength which was essentially hc divided by e where the wavelength is going to be equal to uh constant 
divided by two multiplied by mass and kinetic energy. So the idea is that the particle can behave both like a wave, but it can also behave like uh, a light can behave both like a wave, but it can also behave like a particle. So that was the general idea behind it. The wave particle duality model. Now the final tip for me, for you, for because I really wanted to go through all of this. Obviously, we can't summarize all of Unit Four in this three and four in this lecture. Uh, I focused on motion more because it's a bit, it's quite important. But Unit Four is also very important. I hope what I explained covered a lot of it. Um, the idea is that you need to take care of making sure you have done enough practice exams. Have your cheat sheet ready and please take care of your well-being for your exam if you don't take care of your well-being then uh you're gonna burn out and that's not a good a good idea trust me burning out before the exam is not a good idea burning out means you're less productive overall so uh for your cheat sheet though make sure to include these derived formulas in there so i just put that there for you guys just in case and you can use other ways of revising, but I think doing practice exams is good. And the day before the exam, just rest, guys. Thank you for uh, joining my lesson, and I wish you all the best. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Uh, during the exam, make sure to prioritize. Uh, during the exam, make sure to prioritize. like extended response questions, then do multiple choice because even if you run out of time, you still like have 25% chance of guessing it right. So, yeah. Thank you. For